All right, hello and welcome to the course, An Introduction to the Sacred Liturgy. Uh, I'd like to begin the course with a quote from John Paul II. You'll see there at uh, number one on your handout. Uh, he says, the liturgy, everybody speaks about it, writes about it, discusses the subject. It's been commented on, it has been praised, it has been criticized. And I think most of us would agree with this. Who does not have an opinion on the liturgy? Right? Unless you're absolutely apathetic about uh, the faith or it's a ritual expression, everybody indeed has an opinion about the liturgy. Uh, whether it's uh, uh, the, the homily, the music, the architecture, the, the ordinary form, the extraordinary form, communion in the hand, communion on the tongue, whatever it is, uh, it's difficult not to have an opinion on the liturgy. Let's continue with this quote here. He says, but who really knows the principles and norms by which it is to be put into practice? Ah, now there is the real uh, challenge, though. Anybody can have an opinion, but whose opinion is informed by the principles and norms of the magisterium, of the church, of our tradition, of our constitutions, of our liturgical books? That's informing our opinion is really what this course is about. And to do this, I mean, there's a number of ways, a number of very good uh, things to read and resources and authors to look at. Uh, most of this course will be based on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it's uh, part two, the celebration of the Christian mystery. And as you may know, part two uh, itself is divided up into two smaller parts. The first is some general liturgical and sacramental uh, norms and principles for all types of liturgy. The second part of the second part is about the seven sacraments and the sacramentals uh, themselves. So this uh, session, an introduction to the sacred liturgy, is based on the first half of part two of the catechism. So as we look at that part, the very beginning of part two, uh, the approach that the catechism takes is it begins with an etymology of the word liturgy. And it explains to us that the term liturgy is made up really of two smaller words. The first is uh, laos, which is a Greek term. Right? So, as so many things uh, are, the New Testament is written in, in Greek. Uh, Alexander the Great comes down from Macedon and leaves a whole trail of Greek culture, including its language, uh, in, the, in the Promised Land there. So we have uh, uh, Episcopal, Diaconate, uh, Pentecost, uh, Ecclesial, all of these words are Greek in origin, as is the term liturgy. And the first uh, root then of the word liturgy is laos, and it means people. It's where we get the English word laity, or laic, or laicize. It means the people. Uh, the second part of this term is ergon, and it means work. So you may have an ergonomic work device so that you work safely and efficiently in your office. If you have a cushy diocesan curial job like I do, you know, I've got the lumbar support for your chair and the, you know, the mouse so I don't get carpal tunnel syndrome as I'm doing liturgical things in my office, right? That's an ergonomic work device. So you put these two words together, a laos and an ergon, it means originally in the Greek culture, a work ergon that is done in the name of or on behalf of the people. And if you look at number two there from the catechism, that's exactly what it says. The word liturgy originally meant a public work or ergon in the service in the name of or on behalf of the people. In a Greek culture uh, of the time, this uh, term designated anybody who did such a work. So a school teacher could be considered a liturgist because he performs an ergon on behalf of the Laos or a soldier was called a liturgist. A garbage collector, I suppose, could have been called a liturgist because he performs a work on behalf of the people. Now, along comes Jesus, and the letter to the Hebrews calls him the liturgist. This is in uh, chapter 8, verses 1, 2, and 6, where it says, We have such a high priest, a liturgos, of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle that the Lord, not man, set up. Now he has obtained so much more excellent a liturgias as he is a mediator of a better covenant. So again, if you know any liturgist jokes, remember that Jesus himself is the primary liturgist. Okay, Jesus is the primary liturgist. 
Why would the letter to the Hebrews call Jesus the liturgist? Well, given what we know about the word, he's fittingly called the liturgist because he performs a work on behalf of the Laos. The work that he performs is a work of glorifying God and sanctifying creation, a work that we forfeited with original sin, but a work that we're trying to uh, participate in as members of the baptized. 